I'd like to invite you this morning to take your Bibles and please turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. This Lord's Day, we want to talk about the anger of a loving God. The anger of a loving God. Now, let's start off with a little bit of honesty. How many people here in this audience have a problem with anger? Raise your hand. Let's be honest. It's easy to get angry. In 2012, it's really easy to get angry. Now, you look around, parents get angry at their kids, children get angry at their parents, citizens are angry at the government, the government's annoyed with its citizens, bosses get angry at their employees, employees get tiffed at their employer, neighbors get angry and hold grudges and never talk to each other again, friends have a rift because of an outburst of anger, and wives get angry at their husbands. And you'll notice I'm much too smart to say husbands get angry at their wives, because we never have a good reason to do that. Ben Franklin once wisely said the statement. He said, anger is never without a reason, but seldom is it without a good one. And I like that a lot. Anger is never without a reason, but seldom is it with a good one. A person who's angry on the right grounds, a person who is angry against the right person, a person who is angry in the right manner, at the right moment, and for the right length of time deserves a lot of praise, don't they? Because that seems almost impossible. I love a story about an old lady who came up to an old evangelist from a hundred years ago and she tried to rationalize her anger problem, her anger outburst. And she said to the evangelist preacher, there's nothing wrong with me losing my temper. I blow up and then it's all over and I go on business like normal. And the evangelist wisely said, so does a shotgun, but look at all the damage it leaves behind. And that is absolutely true. You know, it's interesting, the Bible never says anger is a sin. Anger alone is kind of neutral. It's something that we do. In fact, we're told in Ephesians 4, be angry, be angry. The problem is not anger, the problem is what we do with our anger. Because the verse continues in Ephesians 4, be angry and sin not. But you need to understand today, the fact is that God has the emotion of anger. And because we are made in God's image, we also have the emotion of anger. You are going to be angry at times. That's life. But the fact also is, before you all get angry this morning, unlike your anger, God's anger is always perfect. It's always pure. It's always justified. The reason why it says be angry and sin not is it is okay to be angry at times. God has DNA'd you that way. He has made you with that emotion. And yet, when God gets angry, it's totally different. Psalm 7 says it this way, God is a just God, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Now here's the problem I see as a pastor. A lot of people, when they think of an angry God, this is what they think. God was angry in the Old Testament, God's love in the New Testament. Yahweh, Jehovah, is the angry God of the Old, and Jesus is the lovey-dovey God of the New. You've probably heard that before. I heard about a church that's doing a campaign, the love campaign for one year. And they said they're never going to talk about sin or judgment or anger or the wrath of God. They're only going to talk about the love of God because that's really the only thing it's about. But you see, there's a problem with that. And I want you to think about it this way. If you have a right to get angry from time to time, Doesn't God have a right to get angry from time to time? Let me reason it to you this way. If you were to sin only ten times a day for one year, you would disobey God 3,650 times. Now, here's the fact of the matter. Ten times in one day, you're probably thinking, oh, I would never sin ten times in one day. The fact is, I know people, and I have done it myself very often, I could sin ten times in ten seconds. Ten times in one day, the reality might be like a hundred times in one day some days, right? I mean, before you get out of bed, you might sin sometimes. And then, let's just say that 10 times a day for 15 years, 54,750 times. If it's all right for you to get angry, why in the world would it not be all right for God to be angry at sin? God is holy. God is just. God is right. But what's amazing is that God also loves us in spite of our sin. So when we're done today, I want you to understand this thought. This is kind of the thought of the day. To see the anger of God, I want you to look at the cross of Jesus. But to see the love of God, I want you also to look at the cross of Jesus. Now you're in Isaiah chapter 53. One of the most amazing passages in the Bible. This is part three of the tried and true series. It is a tried and true passage. This is a confession 
that will be made one day by many people. When Jesus returns to this earth, they will realize, especially the Jewish people, will realize that what happened 2,000 years ago at the cross, they were wrong. And on that day, they will look back to the cross and they will say these words. But this is also a prophecy. It was written 700 years before Jesus came to this earth. And every word is tried and true. And today we come to the heart of the passage, if you will. We really see what God is going to do with His anger and with His love on the cross, and on the person of Jesus. So if you'll read with me Isaiah 52, we're going to start at verse 13 of chapter 52. God speaks, and then Israel responds. You and I respond our confession. And we're not going to read the whole chapter 53 today. We'll do that next time we're together in this. But just let's hear God's word. And remember, look at the cross, see the anger of God. Look at the cross... I want you to see the love of God. That's our goal today. 52.13, God speaking. Behold, my servant will deal prudently. He will be exalted and extolled. He will be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any man. His form more than the sons of men. He shall sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Now Israel begins to speak. We begin to speak and confess to God what we missed. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, the servant, Jesus, will grow up before God as a tender plant. As a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see Him, there's no beauty that we should desire Him. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Here's our text for today. Notice the frequency of the first person plural pronouns. Surely He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Let us pray. God, we come before You today. We come before You and we realize that You have every right to be angry at sin. We realize today that we need to come to grips with our own anger. Why are we angry? Lord, we need to see your just reason for anger and and challenge our hearts today. But also, Lord, we need to run to the cross and see your love as well. Father, I pray we would not take this ancient, tried, and true prophecy for granted. That today, this would be the deepest confession of our heart. As your Holy Spirit gives us understanding to know your word and to know you better. And Lord, I pray for anyone here today who's not a Christian, maybe someone who's visiting, someone who's been coming and just thinking about the things of God for a while now, and they do not understand a word they've just heard. Lord, I pray you help them to see exactly what it means for you to be angry, but also what it means for you to be a loving God. And we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first few verses of chapter 53, the Jews are saying, Who believed Jesus? Who believed Him 2,000 years ago? Today we can say the same question. Who believed that Jesus was who He said He was? They're saying here, we were unimpressed with Him. We didn't believe the message. We didn't believe the arm of the Lord was with Him. The power of God was with Him. We rejected Him as the Messiah. We looked at His birth and we said there was nothing kingly or special about it. We looked at His life. He lived in a poor Nazareth. A village in northern Galilee where the uneducated live. He was the son of a carpenter. We thought he is not the guy we needed, and so we rejected him. In fact, we rejected him so bad, we chose Barabbas, a murderer, an insurrectionist over Jesus. But then in verse 4, this dramatic change happens in the confession. 
In the future, the Jews will be looking back. Today, we can look back to the cross and we can realize and see the anger of a loving God. We can stop in our tracks and do a 180 and go the other way and say, for so long, we have taken Jesus for granted. We have taken the things of God as nothing but ordinary. And all of a sudden, we can be amazed at who Jesus really is as we read these words. Look at verse 4. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. The word surely here is the word we see in the New Testament and we pray all the time. It is the word Amen. Truly, so be it. Indeed it is. Despite the way we felt about Him in the past, despite the way everyone treated Jesus in the past, and by the way, there's a lot of really crazy ideas out there about the love of God and the anger of God. He is saying here, this is something you can believe. Look, we live in a world where everybody thinks everybody's right. And I hate to break it to you, but everybody can't be right. We live in this world where we live in an age of tolerance. Everyone's view is right, and your view is right as long as your view doesn't say that someone else is wrong. Now, that is impossible to work in reality. I want the truth I want someone to analyze what's going on and give me it cold, hard facts. He's saying here, look, despite the way everyone else thinks and feels about Jesus, and there's a lot of crazy ideas out there, you can trust this. This is amen. This is surely true. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The word borne here has the idea of lifting something up. But this isn't just a power lifter lifting up weights. It's lifting them up and then carrying it away. In fact, the word born here was used a lot in the Old Testament of an armor bearer. An armor bearer would carry extra weapons for his master. An armor bearer would carry a huge shield in front of the master to protect the master. The armor bearer would gladly stand between the enemy and the master and try to stop his sword from striking, stop arrows from hitting the master. The armor bearer would give his life for the warrior. And the point of this is Jesus Christ stood between an angry God and between sinners and between what separates us from God to end the conflict. You see, you need to understand something here. Each person must either bear the burden and the consequences of their sin or that suffering and sin must be taken up and borne by somebody else. You think about what the Bible says about Jesus bearing our griefs and our sorrows. I think of John. Jesus' cousin, he sees Jesus, and what does he say? John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, he bears and removes the sins of the world. First Peter chapter 2, Peter who's an eyewitness of everything Jesus does. Peter who later gives his life for the message of Jesus. First Peter 2, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. But I want you to notice the first thing that Jesus bears, and by the way, we see the love of God here. You want to see the love of God at the cross? Look here. He bears our griefs and our sorrows. This does not refer to our sins yet. The consequences of sins. The effects of sin. There will be no tears. There are no tears in heaven today. Do you understand that? The reason why there's tears here is because there's sin here. There is no sickness in heaven. The reason why there's sickness on earth is because there's sin on earth. And we have fallen from God and His best. You see, the reason why we have no peace in our hearts like we'll have peace in heaven is because our consciences constantly attack us and tell us we're not good enough and that we're failures and that we're sinners and that we're messed up and so on and so on and we fear the anger of God. Look, we live in a world that is hard where people really are weeping, where people are blown away with the pains and problems of society. And will do everything in their power to drown themselves. They'll use whatever substance they can with pride. They'll use whatever they can to drown out the pain. Isn't that true? Because we just can't handle it. They will take it and use it and even abuse it because the pain is so real. But my friends, you need to understand something here. Jesus Christ came to this earth and He endured hunger. You see a little child hungry on the side of the road with their parents homeless. We have that in our county. Jesus Christ endured hunger. He endured thirst. He endured weariness. You get tired of working too many hours and you feel like you just can't keep going anymore. Jesus was a true worker in this world. He endured weariness in the flesh. 
He endured sorrow, pain. You get depressed? Look, Jesus Christ endured the greatest amount of depression anyone could ever endure to the point He sweat drops of blood. Jesus Christ endured every single consequence of sin, the extremities of grief, to the point that He said in the Gospels, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful to death. We know the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. My friend, the image here is that Jesus loaded all of our sorrows, all of our griefs on Himself. We can't handle them. Look, I'm going to be honest with you today. When I get depressed, I can't handle it on my own. When I am down, I cannot handle it on my own. When I see someone who's hurting, I want to help them. But the fact is, I can't do it on my own. I might be able to encourage them, build them up a little bit. But the fact is, the world's way bigger than I am. But the good news is, the world's not bigger than Jesus. And you look here at this. And by the way, mental pain. I just want you to think about this, sorrows and griefs. You know, mental pain can be way harder than any physical pain you ever endure. When your mind hurts and your heart hurts, that can be a lot worse than a broken arm or a bruised rib, can it? I think of Psalms 32. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Isaiah 57. There is no peace for the wicked. Romans 3. Our paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace we have not known. How many of us are carrying around all these emotional inner pains because we've been hurt and we just hold on to them and we keep bringing them back up and we live this endless cycle of grief and sorrow and suffering and the fact is Jesus has already borne all that when He lived on this earth and Jesus is bigger than your problems. Stop telling everyone else how big your problems are, run to Jesus and find a God who's bigger than them and has borne them for you. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about what you will eat or what you will drink or how you'll clothe your body. He said, aren't you and your life and your soul of more value than food and clothing? He says, look at the birds of the air. I take care of them. I feed them. Look at the little flowers in the field, the lilies of the field. I take care of those flowers. They're provided for. Do you not think you're of more value than they? And then Jesus, the good preacher that He is, He adds, oh, you of little faith. Look, if you are hurting today, you must be human. If you are suffering today, you must be real with yourself. You must not be trying to drown it out. Because this world is a world of pain. This world is a world of grief and sorrow. But the fact is, that is exactly why Jesus came to this earth to endure the suffering that we endure. And that's why Peter says, cast all your cares, all your anxieties upon Him, because He cares for you. Look, when Jesus suffered on that cross, the grief and sorrow of the world was on Him. And I want to tell you today, if you want to see God's love, you look at the cross. But secondly, in this verse... We see God revealing the suffering of Jesus that was hidden from every human eye for three hours. But it was the suffering that was very real and the most powerful suffering at all. You see, we see here, as Jesus hung on the cross, the three hours of darkness. And by the way, if you want to see the anger of God, look at the cross. It says here, He was stricken of God. He was smitten by God. He was afflicted by God. The word stricken here, well, we can think about all the ways Jesus was struck. I mean, He was struck with the tongue of His enemies, wasn't He? They said horrible things about Jesus. Look, I've had horrible things said about me as a pastor over the years. It's true. I've had horrible things said about me outside of being a pastor. You've had horrible things said about you, I'm sure. Think about how much it hurts. It makes you lose sleep, doesn't it? Especially when it's not true. Jesus was struck not just words with words, He was struck with hands, with blows, with slaps, with fists, with the cat of nine tails. But this isn't just any individual striking Jesus. This is judicial striking. This is heaven striking Jesus. He was struck by God. This is the anger of God for if you sin ten times a day, 3,650 sins a year. This is God dealing with your sin on Jesus. Judicial striking. It says he was smitten by God. Look, if striking is bad, being smitten is way worse. In the Hebrew language, this word smitten can be translated to slay, to beat, to kill. Divine retribution for a heinous crime. A heinous sin. A very strong word. To be fatally killed. Do you want to wish to see God's wrath? God's anger? You look at the cross. 
Listen, no rod that beat the flesh of Jesus. Hear this. No rod that beat the flesh of Jesus was anything compared to when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No nail that pierced his hands and his feet. No thorn that tore his brow could be compared to the anger of God as he was smitten by God. He had the legal, judicial sentence of the cosmos, of the universe, the sin of the universe striking him by the hand of God. You know, at the end of the service, I pronounce a benediction. That's a a dying heart anymore in the worship services. But I, I pray the blessings of God from Scripture over my congregation because I love you and I want His blessings over you as you leave this place. And they did that in the Bible, so I try to do that to you today. But you know, there's the very opposite of a benediction in this world. It's called a malediction. It's a curse. And Jesus on the cross bore the full curse of sin. For you and for me as he was struck by God. You say, why can't I bear the curse for sin? Why can't I not take my sins on my own body? Why can't I get right with God on my own? The reason why is because you are a finite being. And Jesus is infinite God. And he had to bear the infinite punishment of our sins on himself. You know, you think about this. You know how it feels when someone makes you angry. How about when someone who loves you makes you angry? Can you imagine that the father did this to his son? Can you imagine the grief and sorrow of Jesus as he was bleeding and weeping? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Look, I don't know how bad it is for you today, but I can tell you it's not even a drop in the ocean compared to the wrath of God being poured on Jesus. We talk about the love of God, and it is greater and deeper than any ocean, but the anger of God was just as deep at that moment. God is the ultimate source of the sufferings of the servant. None but God could give the punishment we deserve. You remember when the Passion of the Christ came out, everyone talked about how, was it the Jews' fault that Jesus died? Was it the Italians' fault? We had anti-Semitism. The fact of the matter is, the one who was responsible ultimately for the death of Jesus Christ, it was our sin, but it was the hand of God who had to leverage our sin against Him and the punishment for it. And you notice what they say here, we esteemed Him this way. And that's kind of the problem. The problem was they were looking at Him, and it's true, God was punishing Jesus. We see the love of God in Him bearing our griefs and sorrows. We see the anger of God, of Him being stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But the fact is, they looked at Him and they esteemed Him and thought that's all it was. Jesus was paying for His own sins. That Jesus really was a fraud. Like before you got saved, if you're a Christian today, you didn't really believe Jesus was who He said He was. And you thought He kind of got what He deserved. In fact, the Old Testament said, Deuteronomy 21, if you commit a crime punishable by death, you hang them on a tree, and if you're hanged on a tree, you're cursed by God. And they looked at him and they said, see, he's cursed. He gets what he deserves. But the fact is, he was innocent in all of this. The fact is, it was the anger of God being poured on Jesus, but the foundation of the anger of God being poured on Jesus was the love of Jesus for you and for me. Because he was innocent. You think about Pontius Pilate in John 18. Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man at all. Matthew 26, Judas Iscariot, who lived with Jesus three years, who was with him all the time. If anybody could bring a charge against Jesus, it would be Judas, wouldn't it? And yet Judas brings the money back to the religious leaders, and he says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. He could not even bring a charge against Jesus. Verse 5 makes it clear now. That we understand why he died. It wasn't because of his sin. It was the anger of God. It was because of the love of God. But look, he says, but, yes, the Messiah was stricken and smitten by God and afflicted, but this is the reason why. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. These beautiful little crucifixes of Jesus hanging on walls anywhere, they are nothing. You know, the cross had a foul odor to it as blood and flesh was on it. The darkness over the earth, the crying and suffering and moaning around the cross. The cross was not pretty. This little cross on here and behind me, it was not a pretty sight. Once you understand that. And they look at the cross, people think, you know what people say today? They say this as an insult, but it's kind of true. 
They say the cross is a form of corporal parental punishment to children. Corporal punishment. It's, it's a sickening thing, people say today. Philosophers say that a father would punish his own son and kill his own son in this way. And a lot of Christians are running from that. They're saying, yeah, that is sick that a father would do this to his own child. I want to tell you something. They're right. It is sick. But it also represents the magnitude of his love for you. I mean, look, this is off the charts, mind-blowing love. He was wounded for you. The word wounded here, the New American Standard translates it much more accurately. He was pierced through for you. A penetrating and taking of life 700 years before it happened. Isaiah lays it out perfectly. It's prophesied here, Jesus' hands, His feet would be pierced for you. Jesus' side by the Roman spear would be pierced for you. Our sins were the thorns in Christ's head. The nails in His feet and His hands. The spear in His side. And by the way, when He endured it, He didn't endure it under Jewish law. He endured it under the brutality of the Romans. But I want to tell you something. After His scourging, after these nails... By the way, just think about this, the scourging for a minute. You know, when Pilate had that done, he had that done so they would not crucify Jesus. He had him with the cat of nine tails ripped so badly that he thought the Jews would have pity on him and say, let's not crucify him. Because Pilate didn't want innocent blood on his hands. It was supposed to be an equivalent for crucifixion. Instead, it ended up being the prequel to crucifixion. I mean, this was horrendous. And it was on account of our rebellion, our transgression, our trying to do it our way instead of God's way. Rebelling against the sovereignty of God. And then the second word, He was crushed for our iniquities. He was broken. He was bruised for us. He was crushed under the weight of sin. Look, people can go mad because of their sin. People have breakdowns because of their sin. People have breakdowns because of their guilt. Look, I have enough sin in my own life that I could lose it tomorrow if it wasn't for the peace of Jesus. I'm telling you the truth. If I came to reality with who I am and the things I've done, I could lose it tomorrow. And Jesus bore all of that grief, all of that sorrow, the divine rod of God's judgment, all at that moment. He was crushed for us. And then Satan's attacking him at the same time. In Genesis 3, the serpent will bruise or crush the heel of Jesus. It's like all of this coming on him at once. This should shockingly awe us. And then one more word. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. The word chastisement here in Hebrew simply means discipline. The correction. It's the word used of parents correcting their children when they do wrong. Proverbs 22.15 uses this word. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. His correction. He took what you and I deserved on the cross. I don't know what I deserve if I sin 10 times a day, 3,650 sins in one year. I don't know what kind of a punishment that should be. But I can tell you what, a lifetime of punishment equals hell. But really the fact is, before a holy God, one sin equals hell. And He bears it all. But He does it, He gets this correction by God for your good. Look, if you are a Christian and you feel like God's being too hard on you, I want to tell you something, if God is correcting you, if God is correcting you, it's because He loves you. This is because of His love. And by the way, if you think you are being corrected and it's too hard, look at the cross and see the love of God, as well as the anger of God. And He does it for peace, reconciliation, so you're no more an enemy of God, so you're no more at war with God. He brings racial reconciliation, peace. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, it matters the content of your heart. He brings gender reconciliation. You are no more male and female. You are one in Jesus Christ. He brings financial reconciliation. The poor, the rich, the middle class, it doesn't matter under Jesus' blood. Most importantly, He brings relationship reconciliation. You know, there's this old saying, religion is doing works. Christianity is having a relationship with Jesus. You've probably said that and taught that. You've probably posted it on Facebook before. The fact is, that is not a true statement. Because we all have a relationship with Jesus. 
Every being on this earth has a relationship with Jesus. It's just either a really bad relationship or a really good relationship. Your relationship before the cross is you are an enemy of Him. You ignored Him. You did not believe the report about Him. You rejected Him when you saw Him. You saw nothing beautiful about the love of God. But when you see the cross, friendship, fellowship, prayer, heaven is restored in your soul. And all of a sudden, you don't have a bad relationship. It is wonderful to know God, because even in the worst of times, He is there holding you up, because He loves you. And then it ends, by His stripes we are healed. It's kind of a controversial phrase in the church today, it shouldn't be. By His stripes we are healed. Sin is a disease that brings death to all men. Natural, hereditary, nauseous, incurable sickness that brings death to all. And I want to tell you today, Jesus is a wonderful physician. Jesus is a wonderful physician. He heals by taking the sickness of His people upon Himself, bearing our sins, wounded and bruised for our sins, taking the punishment for our sins. How are we healed? I'll tell you what, God heals people physically sometimes to show how He will heal them spiritually. There are times when we pray and God will physically heal somebody on the spot. Now I'm going to tell you something. Matthew 8, Jesus, working in the evening, told you He worked hard. They brought to Him many who were oppressed by demons, and He cast out spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and He bore our diseases. He beat demon possession. He beat disease, pain, deformities, tears, even death. He removed them all. But the fact is, God in His plan also does allow sickness and death to draw us closer to Jesus at times, to prepare us to meet Him. We are told in, by Paul, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory of heaven which will be revealed in us. I don't understand how all that works. I have prayed for people up front here and they've been healed. I've prayed for people other places and they've been healed and gotten a bill of health. I've prayed over people who are on the brink of death and they died the next day. I've prayed for people who are dead that God, if it would, you would raise them and we will give you all praise and glory. And He hasn't done it. That's His will. But guess what? When they died physically, they were healed perfectly. That's an amazing thing. They were healed at that moment. They were not struck with cancer anymore. Their heart now was perfect in heaven. Their body was not deformed anymore. It was not hurting anymore. God heals everybody that is His children. He may not heal them on this earth, but He will heal them physically one day. Romans 8.23, we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. But He also heals us, most importantly, spiritually. Psalms 41.4 As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, I have sinned against you. If you are burdened down with the anger of God and the grief of sin and the sorrows of sin, run to Jesus. He loves you and He will heal you. You'll be forgiven and it will be like this huge weight has been lifted off your back and you'll be running out of here with the greatest smile. Hallelujah! I am free! The chains are broken! The Deliverer has come! That will be your heart as you leap for joy. I've got to end with verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This has often been called the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. You know John 3.16 maybe. God so, or God in this way loved the world, that He gave His one and only, His unique, His begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. This is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. You see, all we, the good news in a nutshell, the bad news in a nutshell, who is all? We're all all, aren't we? We have been like sheep, By the way, He doesn't compare us to sheep for sheep's good qualities. I hate to tell you that. I hate to break the news. Sheep are foolish. They are stupid. They are helpless. They are headstrong animals. They are totally helpless. Sheep are lost and defenseless. They cannot protect themselves from any danger when attacked at all. Without a shepherd, without a leader, they are as good as gone. He says, we like sheep have turned astray. We have went against God's way. We have looked at Jesus and laughed at Him. We have considered Christianity and faith inconsequential. We have laughed at the idea of heaven on earth. We have laughed at the idea of me needing forgiveness. We have laughed at the idea of God being angry. And we've said, we're just going to keep going our way. And we turned astray. 
Each of us has preferred to go our way instead of God's way. And then here this, Christians, this is the constant temptation you and I have. Our temptation is to condemn others' ways of sin and justify my own way of sinning. We're really good at that. So before you start looking around and saying, well, I'm not so bad at going my own way and start pointing at other people, you are trying to justify yourself. And I hate to tell you this, but if you justify yourself and not Jesus, you ain't making it. You are not making it. Instead of walking God's way, we've turned stubbornly our own way. Any hardhead Baptist in here? Yes, there is. Any hardheads in here, period, if you're not a Baptist? And that's fine if you're not. I don't want you to be a Baptist. I want you to know Jesus. That's fine. There are. You are. We are lonely wanderers. We pursue our own interests, our own plans. We seek to gratify our own pleasures. We live in the world of me, myself, and I. And it's a very little world, and it is choking you right now. We are addicted to one sin. Some are addicted to another. But the fact is, we are addicted to ourselves. And Proverbs 16 says, There is a way that seems right unto you, but the end of it is the way of death. But notice the love of Jesus. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Look at the cross and see the anger of God and the love of God. Jesus was our scapegoat, our substitute. All the burden and punishment was put on Him. It was put on His body. F.C. Jennings has said here, God calls the iniquities of all of us to meet. Hear this, God calls the sin, all of the sin in this room that we've ever committed to meet as myriads of foul sewers might meet in one awful, rushing, filthy, malodorous flood emptying itself at one spot on the nearest and dearest object of God's heart, Jesus. All of that, right on Him. He who knew no sin became sin for us. John Calvin said here, in our own selves, we were scattered in Christ. We are brought back together. By nature, we have wandered. And we are driven headlong toward destruction. But in Jesus, we find the way in which we enter the gate of life and freedom. This was D.L. Moody's favorite verse in the Bible. One of his favorite verses. One day he was getting on a train and a young man came up to him, recognized him, knew he was a great preacher. And he said to Mr. Moody, how can I receive eternal life? And this is one of those Holy Spirit things, because I wouldn't recommend you to make this your answer. But D.L. Moody said to him, I want you to go home and read Isaiah 53, 6. And that's all he said. The man said, what am I supposed to do with Isaiah 53, 6? Moody said, go in on the first stall and come out on the last stall. Go in on the first stall, come out on the last stall. Read it again with me. All, go in, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity. Here's your time to go out on us all. That man went home, read Isaiah 53, 6 over and over again, got on his knees and was changed forever by the power of Jesus. You want to see the anger of God? You look at the cross. You want to see the love of God? Look at the cross. There were a series of tornadoes that caused extensive damage in eastern Ohio and western Pennsylvania. Nearly a hundred lives were lost. Prior to the storm, a man named David Koska was umpiring a little league baseball game in Wheatland, PA. He saw a black funnel heading toward the field, and he rushed into the stands with all his might. He grabbed his little niece. He pushed her into a nearby ditch. He covered her with his body. And then the tornado struck. When the youngster looked up, her uncle was gone. He had given his life in the deadly storm to save her. If he wanted to save her, he had to give himself. So it was with Jesus Christ. Our sins were a heavy load. Our sins deserved the anger of God. But yet God also poured out his love when he poured out his anger. And he gave his all. Do you want to see God's love? Look at the cross. Do you want to see God's anger? Look at the cross. If you don't know Jesus today, run to the cross. And God will help you. He will remove the griefs and sorrows. He will remove the doubt. He will remove the fears. He will remove the burden of sin. And you will be free forevermore. Let us pray. Our God, we are thankful for the anger of you, a loving God. And Lord, as we take your table today, I pray that we would be real with ourselves. That we would get real with you.
if we need You to come into our hearts for the first time and forgive us and change us forever, that we would just right now pray and receive You as our Lord and Savior. Our God, if we are so burdened down with things that You already took, I pray that we would release them into Your hands today. And today we would just commit it all to You, that we would leave it all behind. And God, that we would just lay it at Your feet at the cross and say, God, You are my God. Have Your way with me. Direct me, guide me, lead me, inflame my heart to feel as you feel. Open my eyes to see as you see. Open my ears to hear as you hear. And receive all the glory, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.